everybody. This is Captain Fred, your host for Aviation Theater and a proud member of the San Diego Aerospace Museum, the first place to visit when you come to San Diego. We have a good program for you today, and we'll get started right after this important message. Welcome once again to Captain Fred's Aviation Theater. Before we start today's program, I want to reintroduce the gentleman in the red shirt. You saw him on an earlier program as Johnny Walker with four kills as a P-38 pilot in World War II. His fifth kill has been confirmed and he is America's newest ace. Congratulations, America's newest ace. Thank you. Thank you, Fisher. See you too later. Thank you, Johnny. Standing next to me is a double ace from the Korean War, Colonel Harold Fisher, and he flew this F-86 Sabre jet that we st see standing behind us here. Uh, Harold, jet airplanes actually started much earlier than people think, 1910, 1912. Uh, wasn't there a Frenchman that built a jet airplane back then? Yes. And then uh, nothing came of it, but in the 30s, an English pilot perfected the jet engine on a bench. It never flew. Would you tell our viewers just a little bit about that? The bench test? Mm hmm Well, that qualified as a jet engine. And because it was ahead of its time, it was never accepted, like electric cars. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the Germans, late 30s, the Germans actually flew jet airplanes before World War II. Yes. And then what most people remember is that the Germans came out with the, the bat wing, the triangular shaped uh, little jet that flew with a skid. Rocket Yager. But the real jet that the Germans came out with was the twin engine. What was that? That was the, uh, the Swallow. The Swallow yes. was the twin engine jet. And um, from there, uh, who was the next one to build a jet after the Germans? Italians. The Italians built and, jets. And that was an ME-262, mm -hmm. the Swallow. The ME-262 was the Swallow. And then the Americans didn't get into the jets till much later, 1943. They yes. were late getting into yes. the jets. And uh, what was our first jet? You told me it was a surprise. P-59. Uh, it was an operational squadron that never went overseas. Had a range of 55 minutes. And I think it was based on the Bell Air Cobra design. Which was the P-39, is that right? Yes. Um, then the next jet, I guess, that most people remember or realize was the uh, Thunder Jet. F-84. But prior to that, there was the F-80. Uh, was the shooting star was before that yes. wasn't it? That was uh, the P-80, the shooting star, and then later came uh, the Thunder Jet, the P-84. F-84. F-84. That's right. Tell our viewers about the P and the F, the change. Well, it occurred when the Air Force uh, became a separate branch. The Army had a P for pursuit, and the Air Force, because they wanted to break away and be different, had an F for fighter. And the, uh, the Sabre jet, which came along next, uh, I guess was the first one to be an F or, or not? Well, there was the XP F-86. Yes, experimental pursuit. Mm -hmm. 86, then that became the F-86A. So between the time that it was an experimental and the time that it went online, it changed from pursuit to fighter. Yes. Uh, originally now, the Sabre jet, North American built the Sabre yes. jet, and originally uh, it was to be a straight wing, uh, the same as the Shooting Star and the Thunder jet. But they got hold of some German plans and decided to do what? 
to follow the German plans, and the Russians got the engineers. So the two aircraft had a common heritage. With the swept back yes, from the wing. Germans. And there was another heritage because um, the Sabre jet used an axial flow oh. jet engine, which the original German jets back in the 30s used. Uh, I know it's complicated, but could you just briefly explain what axial flow is to the viewers? The front end, the air goes in, there is a turbine, and there are vanes on the turbine. And, and the turbine is like fan blades. Oh, they're about that big. And at different angles, you had a six stage or a five stage, and as the air came in, it was compressed. And the as it turned faster, it compressed the air until it went out the back as thrust. Okay. Now, uh, this airplane had, um, what was the word? Uh, controlled leading edge flaps? Yes. Which you called slats or slots? Yes. Um, they, they are not on this airplane because they would hang down. So they have been permanently fixed up. But in Korea, the airplanes had uh, leading edge flaps. The F-86F, mm -hmm. this airplane did. And would you tell our viewers the function of those? Yes, it would give you increased lift at all speed. And it could be very useful when you came in to land or take off and also at high altitude. Mm -hmm. And there were, they weren't manually controlled. They were automatic? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the change of speed made them deploy yes. or, or retract? And in a turn, sometimes one would deploy and the other would not. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a very complex airplane for you to fly compared to others. Um, starting off, you would... Um, starting off, you would um, walk up to the airplane and press a button. Yes. And it had an, was an electric hydraulic canopy. Electric. And the canopy automatically retracted. Okay. Then uh, you had to put on a flight suit, which was an ordeal in itself. No, it really wasn't. What it you wasn't? had was like chaps, like my leather pants, mm -hmm. except this part, and you zipped it up. And when you got in the aircraft, you zipped it down, and you plugged in the uh, air pressure. It wasn't difficult. Now you, you carried uh, a May West life vest? Well, you carried a May West, which you wore, and you had parachute you sat on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, then you climbed up through footholds up, what, yes. 10, 12 feet up in the air? What is it, 10 feet up in the air? Possibly. Uh, and you got into the, yeah. the cockpit, and the first thing you did was to put safety pins to secure the ejection. No, the safety seat. pins were already in. They were already in? They better be. <laughs> and that was to make sure that you didn't eject while you were on the runway or on the tarmac. The first thing you did was put those in after you turned off. Mm -hmm. And um, it had a very complex panel compared to other airplanes. Uh, you had not only an instrument panel in front of you, but you had instruments on the left and instruments mm -hmm. on the right. So uh, you taxied out, and uh, you had to sit on the runway to build up a little bit of pressure before you took off? No, you didn't. Uh, the only reason you sat there was if you had a wingman or you had to uh, wait for a flight to get into position. And uh, so you didn't have to, but you did normally to get the wingman and if it's a flight or in the formation to get on the runway. Uh, what kind of a takeoff roll and climb out did it have? I'm guessing the takeoff roll, that gets into, do you have tanks on? And In a combat situation, when we were going out to fly a mission? 4,900 feet. 4,900 feet, uh, almost a mile. Yes. And then uh, you would rotate, wheels would come up immediately. Yes. And then how long to cruising speed? Depends on how long you're going to climb, how far you're going to climb. What was the cruising speed on this airplane? Um, the cruising speed um, depended on whether you had tanks 
whether I see. They, so we ask for a cruising speed, look at the specs, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't okay. know. Okay. Now, uh, this airplane had um, six 50 caliber machine yes. guns, is that right? Yes. And uh, the Russian MiGs had uh, cannons instead of machine guns. They had two cannons, uh, 20 mil meter and 137 millimeter. Yeah, we're talking about 50 caliber machine gun shells on this airplane, which is the size of a cigar, versus the cannons that the MiGs had, uh, and the shells are the size of a cucumber, so they're, yeah. we're talking about a big difference. Yeah. Uh, one hit would destroy the whole airplane, I guess. It, it, uh, it would. A I shell was, the size of a cucumber. I was hit in the right wing one time, and um, it made a, it must have been a 20 millimeter, because it did go through, exit, destroy the hydraulics. Mm -hmm. But if you're a good shot, the 50 caliber is a good too. Yeah. Well, you had, uh, the, the cannons were um, uh, a slower rate of yeah. fire. Yes. So you could get off more 50 caliber machine gun shells than the cannon could. Yeah. Uh, we're going to break for a very important message. When we come back, uh, I want to talk about the, the bounty that the United States placed on a, a MiG. They wanted to get their hands on a MiG. We'll be back right after this important message. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Captain Fred's Aviation Theater. Uh, before we continue, I want to mention that uh, this is an unrehearsed program at the open house for the Aerospace Museum. You'll hear music in the background. You'll hear the loudspeaker in the background. Uh, we're shooting it live and unrehearsed. And our guest today is Colonel Harold Fisher, who was a double ace in Korea. That means 10 kills in Korea. And he did it in this Sabre jet that we see behind us. Now, we've talked about the airplane that you flew. Let's talk a little bit about Harold Fisher. Where were you born, and where did you grow up? Iowa. You were born, and did you grow up in Iowa? Yes. And when and where did you learn to fly? In the Navy in uh, 1944. Um, and I flew the Waco UPF-7. I was in a training program on V-5, which means victory in five years or I'll fight. And they, that's where I learned to fly. For our viewers, uh, the airplane that you flew, the Waco, yes. would be similar to the N-3N yes. or a Stearman. Yes. Uh, um, this fella here served in the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force, all three. And we'll get to how he managed to pull that off. But uh, you served in the Navy, 1944. Then you got out and went to college. Yes. And then you went back in to the Army. Yes. And uh, where were you stationed in the Army? Fort Benning. And were you in a flying status at that no, time? No, I was an infantry officer. Went through uh, their training. And I was on orders to Korea. And I couldn't fly until I got back. But I did have uh, a flight school class to go to from the Air Force. So I was able to go to the Pentagon and transfer my commission from the Army to the Air Force. And then eventually go to flying school. And in the Air Force, where did you go to flying school? Randolph. Randolph, is that in Texas? It sure is. Yeah. Uh, sand in your food, sand in your hair, sand in your bed. Yeah. And uh, what did you fly uh, at Randolph? A T-6s. T-6, an mm -hmm. AT-6. Yes. Uh, or if you're a Canadian, a Harvard. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. Um, so then after you got your wings, uh, what was your first assignment? I was assigned to Korea and to... The Straight eight, over. They didn't mess around. I want huh? to go. <laughs> to the 80th uh, Fighter Bomber Squadron, the Hubats. Mm -hmm. And tell us about your experiences there. Well, I flew 105 missions in the F-80 and then um, went back to headquarters Thief. That's Far East? Air Force. And uh, in combat cruise assignments, and eventually I, I got myself assigned back to the 51st Fighter Interceptor Wing. Back to Korea for yeah. a second time? Yes. Yeah. And tell our viewers what happened during that second tour. Well, I uh, was trained by a wing commander, Douglas Lindsay, who was a Canadian. He taught me to fly and not worry about fuel. He taught me to shoot. 
you shot down one MiG with nine rounds. When Richard Richland that, that's a two-second burst. Less than two seconds. Yeah. That is not even, it's a nanosecond. Richard Richland. And from that, and with people who were a part of a team, like Bill Bowman, who has four kills in 36 hours in the fight, we were a team. And with BA Sims to keep this flying, mm -hmm. it couldn't do any of it if you didn't have the team together. Yeah, that's a perfect segue. The name of this airplane is the Paper Tiger. And on the other side of it, it says Paper Tiger. On this side, uh, you gave your flight mechanic this side, and he put his name and, and his uh, nose art over here. Yes. It was traditional that the crew chief has the right side of the airplane. Okay. Um, I'm going to ease into this gently, but uh, you had an unpleasant situation on one of your flights. I saw three airplanes, and I attacked the first back one, and then hit the second one, and rolled around, and really hit the lead, and parts came off, and went into my intake. And parts of the airplane that you hit? Yes. Mm -hmm. Came into my intake, and I ejected. However... So you weren't shot down? Well, three people have credit for me. Honda Kai, General Honda Kai, Chinese. A um, Dmitry Yermakov, who was a, a fighter pilot who was flying at that time. He's also a hero of the Soviet Union and who really shot me down was a barrel of peace day who the russians say that's the man that did it hmm. well we were surprised at how far the russians had come when the migs first appeared on the scene uh, they were far advanced to, to what we thought the russians had had and um, we offered a bounty of a hundred thousand dollars to anybody who would deliver a MiG to us, and a Lieutenant Ro, R O, I assume Chinese. No, North Korean. North Korean. Uh, he delivered a Russian MiG to us and was paid a hundred thousand dollars. Yes. Now, at that time, uh, a school teacher made three thousand dollars a year. So that was thirty-three years of salary for a school teacher as as a reward. When you were shot down, uh, were you over Korea or were you over China? I was in China. So you went down in, in China. China. Yes. And so you were taken as prisoner, the word? Uh, I was a political prisoner because I violated the sacred territory of China. So you were taken prisoner by the Chinese, not the North Koreans? That's right. Mm -hmm. And how long were you a prisoner? 27 months. Okay. Now, for our viewers, the Korean War ended in June of 1953, but in June of 1953, they didn't let you go. What happened? A political prisoner, there's um, three reasons you have prisoners. They either work, or you barter for them, or they're used as a buyback in some way. Well, you obviously were a, a blue chip bargaining chip. There were others. <laughs> so did they trade you for, an, uh, for another prisoner? This occurred through the United Nations. And so whatever negotiations went on um, remains unknown. But you didn't, get, uh, you didn't get back or you didn't get released until 1955. They kept 50, you two more yeah. years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, then when you came back, you got out in 1955. Uh, you stayed in the Air Force. Yes. And... Uh, you served again in Vietnam. Yes. Would you tell our viewers uh, briefly about your service in Vietnam? Yes, the only way I could get back to Vietnam being a prisoner was to keep going through the Pentagon, saying I want to go back. Finally, they did get an assignment as an advisory group to the Vietnamese Air Force. And the requirement was to be a proficient in all their aircraft, including their helicopters. So I flew, I was there 13 months and largely flew Hueys. But you flew everything that the Vietnamese yes, had? Yes, yes. Uh, airplanes, helicopters, everything they had? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Britain. Then uh, you were assigned, reassigned, and you served out 31 years total yes. in the Air Force. Uh, he retired as a full colonel, bird colonel, and he has the Distinguished Service Cross, the Silver Star, the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Purple Heart, and about 15 other medals that are too lengthy for us to go into today. But I do want to mention that the Distinguished Service Cross is the second highest award that the United States can give, uh, second only to the Medal of Honor. So I want to thank you for your service, not only to aviation, but to your service to our country. What else would you like to tell our viewers? Just the love of flying. I would have done it at any time, anywhere, because I really like to fly. Mm -hmm. um, when um, the Brooklyn Dodgers, when the Dodgers were still in Brooklyn, Roy Campanella was their catcher, mm -hmm. and he was the most valuable player, the MVP, 1951. Mm -hmm. And Branch Rickey handed him a contract, blank. And he says, Roy, you fill in the numbers, and we'll pay it. Mm -hmm. And Roy Campanella signed the contract and handed it back, blank. He says, I'll play for nothing. Right. I love the game. Right. So flying is the same thing. Yes. I'll, I'll fly for nothing. I love right. the game. They pay us. Yeah. Now, uh, today, uh, you own uh, your partnership in a Russian Antonov. About three. Three of them. And you have unscheduled airlines in yeah. Central America. In Guatemala, we have a unscheduled national and international airline. And uh, you're riding a Harley, I assume. You're in your leathers. Yes, these are my Harley it's like As compared to your pilot's wing. Right. Yeah. And we certainly appreciate you coming down to be with us Thank today. You. Um, the rollout ceremony was very impressive. Uh, to, for us to have this airplane, which flew in Korea and is restored, and then to be lucky enough to have the pilot who flew this airplane in Korea were doubly blessed. And you had three aces. And three aces Hank here. Hank Edelman and the gentleman that were here. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure. As always, this is Captain Fred saying, I love airplanes and I honor the people who fly them. Thank you, Colonel Harold Fisher. And My thank pleasure. you for the paper tiger. That's our show for today. We hope you enjoyed it. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. I'd like to thank the San Diego Aerospace Museum, the first place to visit when you come to San Diego, for bringing aviation theater to you. Until next week, this is Captain Fred saying, God bless America and happy landing.